The Pequot War was the first serious conflict in which Puritan military forces engaged and was one of the most significant episodes in early New England history. The war resulted in the extermination of the most powerful Indian tribe in New England. It opened southern New England to rapid colonization. It set the tone for subsequent Indian-Puritan relations and it witnessed one of the most bloody battles of colonial period history when some 500 Pequot men, women, and children were slaughtered in the Puritan attack on the large Pequot village at a place called Misetuk. The Puritans were actually welcomed and even encouraged to settle in Connecticut by the Indian tribes of the region. They were looking to the Puritans as an ally against the hated Pequot tribe. The Pequots were the most powerful Indian tribe in New England by the 17th century. They dominated and subjugated other tribes in the region. By all accounts, the Pequots were persistently belligerent and aggressive. They had a reputation for brutality. In fact, the word Pequot means destroyer. This earned them the hatred of almost all Indian tribes in the region and were frequently at war with them. They also could not live peacefully with the other European colonies. In 1634, the Pequots were at war with the Dutch. One of the most respected and feared was called the Pequot. The Pequots were the most powerful group of native peoples in southern New England at the time that European settlers arrived. They were the most numerous, they were the wealthiest, they were the most politically powerful. Highly organized and aggressive, the Pequots had a gift for trade and expansion. They dominated nearby tribes, using threats and alliances to control the land and trade over hundreds of square miles in what is now eastern Connecticut. Land that included some of the most fertile in the region. The first event leading to the Pequot War was the murder of Captain John Stone and his crew of eight men. John Stone was a Virginian trader with a reputation as a cad and a scoundrel. He was soon unwelcome in every New England colony. On his way back to Virginia, he decided to stop and explore the trading prospects of the Connecticut River. While there, Indians boarded his vessel and killed John Stone and his crew. Though no one in New England mourned the death of John Stone, they could not let the murder of an Englishman go unchallenged if they wished to retain the respect of the Indians and maintain their authority. During negotiations, the Pequots gave their side of the story. According to the Pequots, John Stone had seized and bound two of their men who had boarded his ship to trade. In response to this treachery, the captain's friends ambushed Stone and his crew when they came ashore. The Pequots insisted that all but two of those responsible for Stone's death had already been killed by the Dutch or had died of smallpox. The Puritans were inclined to believe the Pequot side of the story, given John Stone's reputation. Still, according to the Puritan worldview, they had the legal and God-given right to exercise authority and jurisdiction over all the land and all residing there, including the Indians. Puritan justice demanded a penalty be paid for the murder of John Stone. Of course, the Pequots disagreed with this assumption. However, they were not willing to go to war with the English while they were already fighting the Dutch. So the Pequots agreed to Puritan terms. The Puritans demanded that the Pequots deliver the remaining two Indians who were responsible for the murder, pay an indemnity of 400 fathoms of wampum, 40 beaver skins, and 30 otter skins, and yield land for English settlement. The next spring, a Puritan by the name of John Oldham sailed to the Connecticut River to open trade. He found the Pequots, quote, a very false people and disinclined to amicable trade. The Pequots then reneged on the agreement. They did not deliver the culprits and paid only part of the indemnity. Other rumors were coming in regarding Pequot attacks on Puritan settlements and trading vessels. 
During this period of tension between the Pequots and the Puritans, another murder took place which hastened, if not inaugurated, the Pequot War. John Oldham's naked and mutilated body was found on board his ship near Block Island. Those responsible for the murder had sought refuge among the Pequots. Even though the murderers of John Oldham were probably not Pequot, to the Puritans, harboring fugitives was just as bad as the original crime. With the murders of Englishmen adding up, the Puritans now felt they must act or risk annihilation at the hands of an enemy who greatly outnumbered them. A punitive force led by Captain John Endicott was sent to Block Island with instructions to rout the Block Island Indians and then proceed to Pequot territory to secure the murderers of Stone, Oldham, and the other Englishmen and to assure Pequot good behavior. Endicott vigorously complied with his instructions. He secured a beachhead on Block Island in the face of brief resistance and routed the Block Island Indians. While the Indians sought refuge in the swamps, the English burned wigwams, destroyed cornfields, and smashed canoes. After two busy days of destruction, the expedition set sail for Saybrook. The colonists at Saybrook were not happy to see Endicott and his soldiers. They knew they would pay the price for any damage the Endicott expedition caused. Endicott, however, insisted on completing his mission. Four days later, his fleet entered Pequot Harbor. The Pequot spokesman refused to comply with Puritan demands. During negotiations, the English became increasingly convinced that the Pequot's delay was simply camouflage for an ambush, particularly when they observed the Indians move their wives and children and bury their important goods. More Indian procrastination wore the Puritan patience thinner and a final suggestion by the Pequots that both sides lay down their arms, interpreted by the Puritans as a dastardly ruse, brought it to the breaking point. A volley from the musketeers sent the Pequot warriors scurrying for shelter, and the pattern established on Block Island was repeated. The English spent the next two days in rampant destruction and looting. Pequots were smart enough to stay out of range of Puritan gunfire, Still, the Pequots suffered one or more killed and several wounded. Harsh justice had been imposed. Now, harsh retaliation would follow. No sooner than the Endicott ships set sail for Boston than the Pequots drew their first blood. The Pequots began ambushing colonists as they were outside the fort collecting corn. Many Englishmen were killed outright but several suffered horrendous torture, including being roasted alive and having their skin flayed off with hot embers being inserted between the skin and muscle. By 1637, the total number of English fatalities now reached 30. With increasing Pequot hostilities, outright war could not be avoided. Both sides began diplomacy with the neighboring Indian tribes with only one exception, the Pequots failed to get any other Indian tribe on their side. Clear evidence that the Pequots were singularly isolated and unpopular among both the English and the other Indian tribes. The Puritans, on the other hand, secured the alliance of most of the New England Indian tribes who were eager to see the Pequots defeated. The Puritans and their Indian allies began preparations to attack the Pequot village at Mystic. May 26, 1637. In almost complete darkness, just before dawn, the English forces and their native allies, commanded by John Underhill and John Mason, quietly prepared to attack the Pequot fort at Mystic. Inside, Hundreds of men, women, and children lay sleeping, about one-third of the entire Pequot tribe. You had a circular palisade, a wall, that was built by tree stumps laid in a circle and pointing upwards and sharpened at the top. And that had two entrances at each side of the circle where the walls kind of overlapped each other and there'd be just a space you know, wide enough for a person to get through. 
the English troops rose and they commended themselves to God. And then they moved toward this palisaded fort. What they counted on more than anything was the element of surprise. If they could get in without being detected, they could achieve their goal of killing the inhabitants and taking away whatever spoils there were for themselves. Mason divided the forces up and they went to the two entrances and they found that the Indians had covered them with brush. They pulled the brush out of the way and they went inside and started entering wigwams and slashing whatever was there. What was there, of course, were women and children and men. They met with very stiff resistance from the Pequot warriors. John Mason felt that the resistance was too fierce. And he realized that they could not kill everybody by hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So he ran inside, and he got a torch out of one of the fires, and he came out and he yelled, we must burn them. The English intent was not originally to burn the fort because they wanted to save the plunder. But Underhill and Mason were professional soldiers. They must have had a plan B. And that plan was to set fire to the fort, retreat outside the fort to prevent anyone from escaping. The Englishmen ran outside, and the Indians had a choice to make. Stay and die a death under fire, or try to get out. Those that tried to get out were either killed by the English and if they got through that line behind them, there was a line of Mohicans who finished the rest off. It was, it was horrible. The English themselves described this battle in very frightening terms. The destruction, the burning, the killing. There are so many people lying on the ground, Pequot men, women, and children, that the English couldn't even walk without stepping on bodies. The scene was so shocking that even some of the English began to ask if, as Christians, they ought to show some mercy. But Captain Underhill pointed to the Old Testament and said that God wanted those who were sinners, heathen, to suffer, he said, the terriblest death that may be, and that the innocent needed to suffer along with the guilty. Even though the Narragansett and Mohegan had no love lost, for the Pequots. They were absolutely shocked by the brutality that the English displayed to attack uh, elderly men and women, or women and children, women with nursing children. They went up and threw their hands up and said, mach it, mach it, it's too much. They were dis distraught is not too strong a word.
hundreds, hundreds of people lay dead. And it was a moment that changed everything for the English and the Indians. Not just for that day, but from that day forward. The possibilities of trust and cooperation that had been there at the beginning went up in smoke. The massacre at Mystic took only one hour, one hour to kill hundreds and hundreds of Pequot men, women, and children. But it was far from over as tribe members who were living nearby were about to find out. After the massacre, the other Pequot villages attempted to come to their rescue. They saw the smoke, and they immediately started to come towards the fort to see what had happened, because they knew their women and children were there. But they were too late. It was overwhelming for them. You have to understand that this is a moment for the Native people that was beyond their comprehension. They never fought wars to wipe out another group. Within a few weeks after the Mystic Massacre, the English began a systematic attempt to hunt down all the surviving Pequots. They wanted to eliminate Pequot leadership. They wanted to make sure that the Pequots would never again come together and be a threat to them. John Mason summed up the aftermath of the Mystic Massacre in this way. Thus did the Lord scatter his enemies with his strong arm. The Pequots now became a prey to all Indians. Happy were they that could bring in their heads to the English, of which there came almost daily to Windsor or Hartford. We estimate that about 1,500 Pequots were killed or sold into slavery after the Mystic Massacre. Many Pequot Indians are sold to other English colonies outside of New England, so sold to Bermuda or sold to the Caribbean islands. That way they can never come back to pose a problem for the English ever again. The Treaty of Hartford officially ended the Pequot War with a set of provisions that are about as bad as provisions can get. Men who had fought against the English in the Pequot War had already been killed or sold into slavery Women and children who survived were given as servants to the Mohegans or to the Narragansetts. What you have embodied in the Treaty of Hartford is literally uh, a statement espousing genocide. It was a cultural genocide as well. The tribe's name, its language, all of those were outlawed by this treaty. Officially speaking, the Pequot Indians no longer existed. The Pequot encounters with the colonials are going to reverberate and set the stage. The massacre at Mystic would be repeated. Even the Narragansetts, who had allied with the English during the massacre at Mystic, were not safe. Just 40 years later, in one battle of what became known as King Philip's War, the Narragansetts were similarly massacred their survivors sold into slavery. It was repeated over and over again. Either you sold the land, you moved off the land, or we would push you off the land. The mistrust that could lead to incredible violence continued for 250 years. It marched across the country in battle after battle, dispossession after dispossession. The massacre at Mystic Fort shaped the rest of our history. Victory over the Indians was seen as a triumph of light over darkness, civilization over savagery. And that became, for many generations, our nation's central historical myth. <laughs>